welcome to our parent forum tonight. I'd first like to introduce Anne Beneventi, and she is the first master practitioner who was licensed in the, or certificated in the Anna Marie Roper method of qualitative assessment. And she has a thriving practice up in the Bay Area. Uh, she does qualitative assessments for many of the schools for gifted in the Bay Area. And they're, they're really uh, using that method of deciding about children getting into the schools. And uh, Anne also is coordinating our assessments in the Bay Area. We've been invited to Baywood Learning Center and to Spring Hill uh, to do assessments of children. So Anne coordinates all of that. And uh, Helen Dudney, uh, most of you met this afternoon. She's from Sydney, Australia. And she is the founder and director of Australian Gifted Support Center. And has uh, been an extremely active voice in Australia for parents of gifted children, for twice exceptional children, for visual spatial learners. And she has... Uh, developed a computer program with Maxine Cowie in, in Melbourne, Australia to, um, to help visual, spatial, and twice exceptional children? Primarily Maxine's. Primarily Maxine's. And Linda Levitin uh, is uh, the founder of Whole Child Assessments. And she had a chance to talk about that a little bit today. And she's been director of our West Coast office in Granada Hills for a long time. And Linda and I have known each other since she was 12. <laughs> so we've been working together a very long time. Uh, and Bobby Gilman is the associate director of the Gifted Development Center. And one of the finest testers in the world. It's just she, her rapport with children is phenomenal, her interpretations, her reports, and she uh, supervises everyone who comes through our office, uh, so they get a fantastic training when they come because of Bobby. And I'm Linda Silverman with the Gifted Development Center, and we're celebrating our 30th year. So this, is, this uh, symposium is a celebration. And that's all the time we have. <laughs> <laughs> Someone want to ask a question? So now, what are your questions? Okay. <laughs> um, Linda, I should know the answer to this, but I'm wondering if you could work with the testing companies and were able to take the processing speed completely out of IQ tests, would that be your preference? Yes. Thank you. I'd like to add to it, if I could. I, I wouldn't take it out, but I wouldn't make it part of the full-scale IQ score. Um, there are times when we have children who are painfully slow at whatever they have to do in the classroom. We need to document the need for accommodations there while still, you know, hitting that delicate balance of... Uh, convincing schools that they have to support the giftedness first, but they also have to give this kid a keyboard or extra time or whatever. So I, I think we'd all like to have the measurements. They're nice. They're diagnostic. We just don't want them part of the full-scale IQ. Thanks. I, I agree with both of you, of you, but I have found it interesting that it, for me, it's a good behavior observation because I deliberately try to be very casual in my showing how to draw a line on symbol search. And I've literally had children correct my line and um, insist on drawing from the top one edge of the corner of the uh, rectangle to the bottom. And so it's a really good sense for me of how deliberate, perfectionistic their style is, um, more so than some other things. So I like it in there from that, from that point of view. Um, so it's been kind of funny to watch their reaction to that. My question is, um, do you think that people, children, are getting smarter? And if so, why? Um, 
John Wasserman um, has been looking at the so-called Flynn effect, uh, where basically the idea is the population of the world is getting smarter uh, bit by bit. But there's some evidence, according to him now, that in Western countries, uh, this trend has ended. So I'm not sure what that means, whether it's because we're all, you know, so tuned into TV or our computers or we have lots of information. We aren't sure why, but um, that would be a question to have him follow up on. Well, I was going to say that depends on what you mean. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, what I'm seeing is uh, sort of the needs of the, the community. Um, mo part of my practice is in Seattle. I see a lot of Microsoft executive children, Boeing. Their visual spatial skills are incredible. And, you know, I'm seeing a, a different kind of ability that is expanding exponentially, the creative and the, uh, you know, just the ability to, to think outside the box. And, you know, which of course is more difficult to test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it does, to me, it does feel like we're getting smarter or that we're doing something that's allowing these kids to show more of what they can do. Mm -hmm. In qualitative assessment, we are looking at emotional characteristics that we know have a correlation to intellectual functioning. And so when we look at something like empathy, um, we, we know that, there, that that is a sign of giftedness. And something that I've really noticed over the years in looking at these children uh, there's a lot more children with this incredible empathy, which I think is really, really positive. So if we could define getting smarter as having more empathy, then I, I see it in the population that I'm working with. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we're looking at the evolution of society. Okay. This is about um, overexcitabilities. Do people outgrow certain overexcitabilities if, if people respond to them, you know what I mean, negatively, or are they just sort of controlling them or learn how to work around them? Is that how it works? But they keep it, keep the... Forever. Forever. <laughs> OE stands for original equipment. <laughs> Born in, you die with it. <laughs> Helen, you want to take that one? I think perhaps part of what happens is that as we, as people grow older, they learn ways to manage it right. so that they can do the things that they want to do. And I think that's part of what we've got to do with the kids is realise that this is who part of who you are, mm -hmm. but there are times where it's appropriate to jump up and down and run around the room. And there are other times where you need to maybe wiggle your toes inside your shoes or play with a fidget ball or something like that because it's not appropriate within that environment to behave in a certain way. I think the emotional one is harder but it's a really, a really important one that we help people learn to manage their emotions mm -hmm. in a way that um, helps preserve them as a person. Mm -hmm. um, so I think part of it, that's part of that job of helping them understand who they are and be comfortable with who they are and that's why we then can perhaps see people who used to look like this but now but, right. seem to have lost it. Right. Uh, but most of the time if you talk to them you actually find out that they tell you what hard work it is. Right, okay. Uh, and I was going to say that a lot of the adults that I see who feel as though they're repressed and who are depressed mm -hmm. as a result um, part of it is the effort that they've had oh. to put into repressing their overexcitabilities and, and not being able to be authentic in environments that were important to them. And so part of it in the process of, of helping them is to let them refine who they really are and then let them decide what environment they're going to be express, expressing it. Is there a connection with sensory processing disorder or sensory, sensory integration disorder in the OEs, the overexcitabilities? Has, there, has that been looked at? Uh, we've been looking into that because uh, that we give two different instruments mm -hmm. to all of the children who come to our office 
for uh, assessment, not only in Denver, but also Linda uses these instruments, Anne uses these instruments, and um, I think, Helen, you do too, don't you? So the, the short sensory profile was developed by Lucy Miller. It's an OT, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, uh, modified Winifred Dunn's sensory profile, which is similar but a lot longer. Okay. And we've been giving the uh, OIP, the Overexcitability Inventory for Parents, and where I expected there to be the greatest overlap was in sensual overexcitability. Right. Because of the tags that mm -hmm. you have to get, you know, with seams and socks and things like that. And in um, the uh, kind of sensory modulation issues that show up on a short sensory profile, we're finding almost no correlation. Really? And I think it's because if you look at the questions on the overexcitability inventory, the sensual questions aren't about, I can't stand the tags in my clothes and I can't stand the, the seams and my, my socks have to be perfectly even. They're about aesthetic appreciation. My child responds to color, to beauty, to art. And so the sensual ones in that instrument are all about the positive sensual experiences mm -hmm. and the short sensory profile is picking up on the uh, indicators that the child is uh, unable to modulate sensory information so there is an overlap but the instruments aren't showing them because i would think that it would also overlap then with the maybe the over emotionality if they can't handle their sensory load, then they become over-emotional or also um, physical or energy. I can't remember what the other, Psycho oh, psychomotor, Psycho if maybe they're bothered by something, then they don't know how to process that and it is expressed in a psychomotor way as well. Well, I am finding some interesting patterns on psychomotor and maybe Bobby has as well. I notice that if psychomotor is the highest one that the parents endorse on the overexcitability inventory for parents, they often are endorsing an awful lot of the behavioral checklist for attention deficit oh. disorder because there is an overlap in hyperactive symptoms on those two instruments. Um, we are certainly seeing that the children who have sensory overload mm -hmm. do seem to have overexcitabilities. But um, the instruments themselves are measuring some different qualities. Okay. So imaginational overexcitability isn't, uh, it, if you're thinking about um, imaginary companions or you imagine that your teddy bear is real or something like that, um, that doesn't seem to overlap with anything in the uh, sensory so. processing disorder mm -hmm. area. And then intellectual overexcitability doesn't seem to overlap. The psychomotor does, the sensual does, and maybe a little bit the emotional. Okay. But if you looked at the instrument, it's, it's emotional attachments, right. uh, closeness with uh, friends and places. And so they're really looking at different variables. Right. It's not that the, the constructs don't overlap. It's that the instruments don't measure the overlap. In terms of OEs, I've mostly heard about them talked in terms of how valuable they are for self-knowledge yes. or parent knowledge, and that's truly amazing. But I'm also wondering, in an ideal world, if any of you have seen, knowing what we know about gifted children, actually incorporated into the curriculum in unique ways. Uh, I teach emotional intelligence at the school that I co-founded for Gifted. So I have opportunities to do anything I want to do. And one of the challenges that we have is literally developing curriculum in new ways for the population we're actually working with. So I was wondering if anybody's seen any interesting models that really look at that. Yeah, I have. Yes. I, I think the person is Cindy Strickland. I'm not exactly sure. Am I right? Correct. And there's a whole group. Okay. 
Uh, if you Google her, there's a whole unit of work that she's written on overexcitabilities. I think it's aimed at middle school. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen it used. I know of a few people in Australia who've had permission to use it and I know that within the website she's asked for feedback for con continued development of it. Mm. you spell it S-T-R-I-C-K-E-N? Uh, S-T-R-I-C-K-L-A-N-D. Strictly. Okay, thank you. I know one of the things we've done is specifically incorporate risk-taking into the curriculum and dealing with perfectionism into the curriculum. But we hadn't taken the next step to do OEs in the curriculum. So I just was, I will very much look that up. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, you from, from Australia if you have dealt with the gifted and motivated. And what are the steps to deal with teenagers, let's say 12 to 14, 15, who do not want to do work in the class? Um, yes, I think anyone who's worked with gifted has worked with gifted and unmotivated. The bulk of my work isn't with that age group, it's actually with younger age groups. And, but generally if I was working with teachers or parents, I would look at seeing if they could identify the children's strengths and passions and come at whatever they were doing through their strengths and passion. Uh, one of the things that I recommend to parents and teachers is that they try not to withdraw the one thing in their child's life that is working for them because often that's used as a, if you don't get on with your schoolwork, with what's expected of you, you'll have to drop out of soccer, you'll have to drop out of ice skating, whatever. But I would always encourage them to keep the thing where they're actually being successful so at least somewhere in their life they're getting that feeling of intrinsic motivation and performance um, so that would be a component of what I would do I also recommend that they if they can try if it's an individual classroom teacher and they've got a suspicion that something's going on because if you've got an underachieving gifted or highly gifted child, they're very good at that. They've spent years investing in becoming very good at that. So by the time they get to that, in our case, it's our junior high school, but your middle school, um, if they don't want you to know about it, you're not going to find out. But I find that often humour might be the way. So incorporating multi-level humour within classroom environments where they will get it at a level that is different and using that as the beginning of the connection of and then once you see it just allowing that to subtly be there so it's sort of a way of saying I know you're there up in the back corner and I'll just keep letting you know that I'm there so that's a, a part of making a connection and then a third one is to try to find someone within the whole faculty of the school who might end up being a mentor and I usually recommend it's not someone who's a classroom teacher of that child so that there is a connection outside of every other class that they're in. Mm -hmm. And I guess a lot of that has come from that fairly small study that I think Erickson did ages ago looking at long-term underachievers who had turned, turned it around and it seemed to link that the two things that came out for all of those students were that their parents had always believed in them, even through all the ups and downs, and one particular teacher had seen the strength and believed in them mm -hmm. during all of it. And they were the two key factors that I remember coming out from that. Thank you. That was Linda Emmerich's oh, study. Emmerichson, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Emmerich. Emmerich, thank you. <laughs> um, lately, I've had a number of underachieving junior high children that I've been consulting with their parents, um, most of them by phone, and with them. And one of the things that I've noticed is that there's an interesting emotional component in that because, of course, those years are, you know, hormonal years and they're transitional years. And one of the things that I've noticed is there's an interesting interaction with the parents and their need to have control over their environment. And so it, it becomes a family system issue as opposed to just the school, which is really another system, an extension of the family. 
And so what I've encouraged uh, in those cases, and what I actually see Bridges School doing too, is putting the responsibility on the child to come up with an assignment that will interest them, that they can find in their passion, and then coaching them on how to do the mechanics of it. So for instance, um, I had one child who just was so resistant to writing any report on anything. And, uh, you know, and I discussed with him, well, you know, well, what's your passion? You know, of course, it was video games. It was a, a boy. And, um, <laughs> and I said, well, what is it that makes video games so special to you? What, you, what, is it your, what is your passion about it? And he said, well, I know how to hack for the codes. I said, well, why don't you write about that? And he w it was like a light went on. And he said, that would be great. And he immediately went, wrote a whole report, had no problems, and he was not uh, very verbal, and he had had serious problems really getting his ideas on paper, and I suggested that his mother let him dictate it. Mm -hmm. And he dictated it just literally, extreme. fluidly, extreme, incredible, explaining how you did it, what games were good to do it on, I mean, every detail of this subject. He then took it into the school, and the principal wouldn't allow him to submit it, said it's an inappropriate topic. Mm. But for him, that was okay because he had written a great report, and he knew it. Mm -hmm. And so once he knew that, he could then say, you know what, I know I can write these reports now. It's just a matter of finding something that, you know, that's a hoop that they'll let me jump through mm -hmm. instead of one that I want to jump through. But I know I can do it. And so part of it is is identifying something that they can believe in so that they want to have that as something, a passion. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of it was also helping him to find a way to structure writing a report, which he didn't even, he didn't really have those skills, which that's where I came in. I mentored him and said, okay, you know, use this. I use, why don't we, why don't we use a model of a tree and you can, you know, start with the tree trunk, use the branches, mm -hmm. right, do the leaves, and lay the leaves out on the floor and then organize it the way you want. And then from that point on, he was fine. Wow. But it was just a matter of, you know, there's, there's two different things. And I encourage teachers really to give two separate grades on almost mm -hmm. anything, one for content and one for mechanics, mm -hmm. so that at least the child can get something for their effort so they can feel that, you know, mm -hmm. if the content is good, that they're going to get validated for that creativity and then they, they can deal with the mechanics later that's that's the then the teacher can say okay you know i love your topic i love what you had to say about it now we're going to focus on how you said it mm -hmm. thank you I think it may also be a good time to look at some options for other classes, especially with highly gifted kids. We see a lot of them for whom seven years of, of middle school and high school are too many, and often and uh, the easiest time uh, to perhaps move ahead is in middle school where there aren't specific specific numbers of credits one has to earn before one moves on to high school. Um, I've seen a lot of kids who, for example, were um, strong in science and they wanted to do the three years of middle school science in two years and then maybe start taking high school classes. Uh, or there are some nice talent search courses uh, that might be substituted for some of the courses at school. Some of these kids need uh, a way to stretch and uh, do more and have a more individualized program and um, feel they feel stifled that they're kept at a certain level with very few options and I think that's the time to go to work and put everything on the table and see what options it might be out there. Um, I know there are some uh, classes, for example, like Duke has some online courses, uh, AP courses that younger students take. Uh, there's a number of programs like that. We've recommended Stanford or Johns Hopkins math programs for a long time. Um, there are lots of ways to do this or perhaps work with a mentor in writing outside of school and let it substitute whatever is done has to substitute for the regular level work, not be in addition to. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that can give some additional flexibility for some of these kids and um, some room to stretch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
I was just going to add to, um, you were talking about finding the child's passion, and um, not only in writing a report, you could take that to um, the history, social studies, you know, how were games, uh, video games first developed, who came up with that idea, you can find the math, you know, in that also, and and you can, you know, uh, economics, um, science, there's everything, you can cover every subject based on, on that kid's passion. And uh, it's really incredible art. I mean, everything, and it's 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 amazing. And they just they just light up because it's something that they really enjoy. And yet they're learning so much about it. So I just wanted to add that. Just one of the other things that uh, re remembered when Linda said about the hoops. One of the other things that I often talk to the kids about is to see if they've got an idea of where they want to be heading. And once they've if they have. It doesn't matter if everyone in the room feels that it's probably not going to be the pathway. But if they have, then especially in those high school kids, I say, I talk about learning to jump through the hoops to get you there in the most direct route. And that it's the game we call school. And actually take it sort of, this is a real world and this is what you'd like to be doing. And you have choices. There are lots of ways to get where you'd like to go. But if you'd like to get there the fastest, it's learning to play that game. And you can see with these bright kids that they can see the logic of that. And they look at it then slightly differently. I wanted to say one more thing that I learned from my own children. Um, I had a, a, one of my children had some learning disabilities and he was a reluctant junior high, you know, work, doing his work. And at one point, you know, there was he had a particular class he wouldn't do it, and I I said you know, you know my bottom line is you need to at least do the work adequately, and he said, but I'm never going to get more than a C from this teacher, and I said, okay well let's try this out, and so I got my PhD fiance and I we did his next assignment for him, and we did it we followed the rubric to the nth degree so that there couldn't be any you know details that affected the grade, and. He turned it in as his. He wrote it out by hand, and he got a C. And <laughs> and I said, okay, you know, you're off the hook. You have to turn in your papers. But you know, as long as you do an adequate job, I'd, I don't care what the grade is because it's obvious that that teacher isn't seeing you. And that was a more powerful validation of him than probably anything I could have done. I didn't, you know, purposely, I mean, I thought I was going to get a good grade. I mean, <laughs> 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 but when I didn't, I said, okay, mind shift, reframe. And to me, you know, it was such a powerful learning experience for both of us that I never had another problem with him getting his work in. And I can't think that it was because he suddenly, you know, had an epiphany. It was because there was some validation from, from me that said, I believe you when you say that. And, you know, now you have a different choice. Your, your choices are different than they were before this experience. Oh. Well, I was going to say that um, I taught middle school for a long time. And that I was very lucky because I was teaching in a private middle school, so I didn't have a, an incredibly rigid curriculum plan. I could really do it from a very constructivist approach with a completely emerging curriculum with the kids. And I saw a lot of, um, I would say that probably 50% of my class were gifted, unmotivated learners. So this was a, it was a daily, a daily thing that I had to meet them where they were and mold myself to their needs on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, one of the things that I learned is that it is very, very normal for the 12 to 14 or 15-year-old child, particularly boys, I have to say, to um, it's very normal for them to do nothing for very long periods of time. <laughs> and that I believe that this is extremely beneficial and that we shouldn't get so wound up about it because actually their bodies and their brains are changing so rapidly from day to day that even though from an adult perspective it looks very suspiciously to us like they are doing absolutely nothing whatsoever of anything purposeful <laughs> but in fact there is a tremendous amount of activity that is going on and we just don't frame it in the same way that they do um, but just to 
build on something that you were saying. Um, I had a child who I suspected was very gifted, but did nothing for almost an entire year. And in the end, I just decided that um, I approached my teaching not as an authoritative teacher, but as a collaborative teacher. And I was completely overloaded. And so I just decided one day to sit down and write out all the things that I had to get done. And I started delegating them to my students. Um, because I felt that if I gave them real meaningful work that was contributing to the community, that they would rise to the occasion as opposed to giving them busy work like grammar and things. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and hey presto, you know, my class did the yearbook, they organized a trip to Europe, they organized a camping trip, they organized a rafting trip, they organized a list of field trips to do with the environment and, and stewardship of nature. And all of a sudden I was like, yeah, I think I finally figured this out. These kids actually are so much more capable than we adults realize. And that if we could just relinquish the majority of our adult control and actually hand it over to them, they are so incredibly capable of so much more than we realize and that was not work that was ever graded or ever quantitatively measured but from a qualitative perspective the community building and what i learned from them was so much more valuable than anything that they could possibly have learned from me to do with apostrophes or anything like that so <laughs> one of the questions that i had was uh what is your guys's experience between um i assume that you work a lot with the private schools, but also with the public schools in their gate programs. Because I'm finding, uh, my wife teaches uh, elementary school and she, she explains to me that they basically do some testing for gate, for giftedness at an early age, but they don't actually identify them and put them into a program till the third grade. And that, um, you know, they don't tell the parents because they don't always want to be harped on because every parent assumes, this is what my wife says, and I hope she never sees this. <laughs> uh, she says, you know, every parent thinks their kid is gifted. And um, so they always come up and they're, you know, most of the teachers don't want to have to deal with the, the, the problems that, uh, you know, the parents coming up and constantly bothering them. Now, my question is, is that what would you do in order to, or, or how can you relieve that problem, especially if you know that your kid is gifted and he's, he or she is in that program in, and you can't get her out of there or he, you can't get him out of there um, and uh, the, the money isn't there to, to be able to put them into the, uh, into the, the private, uh, the private schools. So, what is some? You know, do you have any suggestions? Well, I can I can talk about this area because um, this is where I am. I one of the things that some of the public schools do is they create magnet schools, and if you know the system, you can once your child has the identification as being a gate child, you then can apply to specific schools that only these children are al allowed to attend and then the curriculum is more uh, tailored to a gifted child and what that means is not necessarily that the teachers are trained to teach gifted children although some are um, it means that their class is not going to have a span of children a teacher is not going to be expected to teach children who have the skills of you know two years behind all the way up to two or three years ahead in ability. It'll take the bottom range away so that the teacher can focus on a, maybe a two or three year uh, difference in skill levels. And that is sometimes enough so that the teacher can allow some of their creativity and some of their uh, abilities to inspire the children. And so it, it's better. Um, it's not perfect. There are also some schools for highly gifted in the magnet system. Um, and what parents do if they don't live in LA Unified is they find an address and they get someone who'll sponsor them essentially and, and so that they can get into this lottery system basically where so they'll get into the, a magnet school. Uh, <laughs> they cheat, <laughs> yes. Um, but it's, it's worth it in a sense because at least 
you have a chance of your child being in one of these programs. Because my experience of the pullout programs, which some of the schools are consider their gate program, is that either it's not really that much enrichment. It's just um, instead of going into depth, it's breadth of information. And so the children feel actually overwhelmed. They get just more work. And they don't, f and, and it's actually, you know, considered a burden to them. And so frequently they, they don't like it. Um, but if they're in a classroom with peers, which is validating in and of itself, um, they can stand out and they can shine, and it's not something that makes them, you know, feel, you know, that they're weird. It makes them feel that they're okay. And so, you know, and I mean, I can give you, you know, one story that'll tell you how innocently teachers can, um, can treat children in ways that hurt them, the gifted. Um, I had <laughs> my son, when he was in, in sixth grade, had a teacher who adored him, raised his hand to ask a question, and she said, class, um, let's everybody listen, because if Michael has a question about this, um, everyone must be having problems with this. She didn't mean to, you know, put him in that position. I mean, she was, you know, she was just saying what she could, should have kept inside of her body. But, uh, <laughs> but the truth was, you know, that was probably true. But, you know, of course he had to deal with, say, you know, the kids making fun of him and saying, oh, if Michael doesn't understand, nobody will. But, you know, it's innocent sometimes. So that's why going through the system and whatever is available is, is worth it. I think the most common type of child that we assess at our center is a child in public school uh, who probably has been identified for the gifted program, but maybe not. But the program is very meager. It's usually a pull-out program. Uh, maybe the kids get an hour or two a week doing some kind of project. And what we find over and over is that these programs aren't addressing the full-time classroom situation where the frustration lies because we have kids who are very efficient learners and, you know, they already know a lot of what's being taught uh, at the beginning of the year and, and, and they're sort of selectively taught to be lazy to put their minds on hold and accept the slow pace. So it's the classroom issues that are more problematic. So what we typically do is we test them and then we document the giftedness and then hopefully document the achievement levels too. And then we have something to work with. We can write a report that says, well, you know, this child's going to need advancement in math or very advanced reading or, and, and we try to make specific recommendations assuming that the classroom teacher may not know what to do with this child, you know, starting with the greatest strength, the, the area that the child's most passionate about, or, you know, there's always a, a, a first position thing that you want to look at, and then the second thing, and then the third thing. And you try to give several good recommendations so that a responsible teacher will be convinced at least by your documentation of abilities and levels of achievement that it's important to do something. So that's what we do. And that helps the parents because then it's not all on their shoulders to go in and say, well, we, like everyone else, think our child is gifted. Uh, you know, they can hand this report to the teacher and share it and say, you know, what, what can we do to work this out so that uh, each day in the classroom means more. Uh, I wondered if Jack Scher or if Vicki Stanton who, if you've had experiences with the GATE program, uh, in uh, that you could maybe shed some light on this question too. If, if do you either have, Vicky, would you like to say something? I work in a high school. Um, I'm a school psychologist in a high school, and um, it's a very high achieving high school. Um, to my knowledge, we don't do anything with the GATE kids. Um, they have, um, they are identified as GATE. We offer, as at the high school, um, AP classes, honors classes, but there's nothing specific given to the GATE kids in the high school. If we have some very, very high achieving students, then I think uh, the parents typically do things on their own. To my knowledge, the school district does nothing in the high school level. 
kind of following up on your question as another option, uh, I'm real interested in home teaching and the benefits and the pros and cons, if you wish. And I'd like to hear what the panel feels about that. Well, we have a home teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I've been uh, homeschooling my kids uh, uh, most of their lives. Uh, found out in kindergarten that my oldest, who's now 11, just didn't fit, and my uh, daughter um, just decided that she that preschool was for babies, and she quit. So um, uh, there's so many options available in homeschooling um, that you you can not only going um, with like a, a public um, uh, charter, a, a public charter school that you choose your own curriculum that would fit the child best, or you can do something like a, an R4, which is in California, you file uh, this R4 form with the state and become your own private school. And there's also uh, various um, uh, religious-based um, homeschool programs and on the internet. I mean, it's just flooded with different um, homeschool curriculum. But it's really knowing your child and um, and from these reports and the assessments, you really get a good idea of their, their strengths and weaknesses. And also finding their passion is, uh, is such a big thing because you can tailor the learning to fit them and you're working with them one on one and also there's um, homeschool co-ops where you get a few families that have the same interests or maybe one parent is you know they were a writer you know so they would teach you know the writing class and another one is an engineer and they would do science and and so forth so there's if you want more interaction um, in that way then that's possible but um, uh, I have found that um, now my son, 11, is now taking his third class at um, community college. And um, so he's, he started when he was 10. And um, it's just working out exceptionally well. I mean, he's, it's, he comes out of that class, you know, computer science, you know, and he's just, you know, skipping and singing and just like, oh, I love it, you know. And, and it's amazing to see him, you know, do that. And his classmates are, you know, he's got lab partners and they're just working along just fine. There's, there's just no problem. I mean, they're on the same level. And he may be a little bit shorter than them, but <laughs> it's working out, you know. And, and, and they're happy and they can go and just soar. And many times I feel like I'm in, I've in their way, you know, and I don't want to hold them back. So I've found tutors and mentors and go to the community college and, and I'm just their guide and I look for the resources and bring them to what my, my children need. Well, I just wanted to mention to follow up on it, if, you know, it's a great opportunity for kids to go to a community college for one or two courses. And then another option, if they're, you know, well advanced along every dimension, is the early entrance program at Cal State LA that my son is in, and he's graduating this year. He started there at 14, and he, it's been a wonderful fit for him. It has been by far his most positive school environment. So, but I do say it, it is, has to be for the right child because they're on their own and they have to be self-reliant and, and have to want it. But it's a program also, one of the benefits of the Cal State program is it's 150 kids. So it's nice because it has a social component to it that perhaps going to an individual college, you know, is not going to have. It's 11 to 15 year olds, so they do accept children younger and you have to score uh, if you think of the old SAT, you have to score at least 1,100 on the SAT. So it's above average on a college entrance exam. And then you have an interview, and you actually try it out for the summer. When I talk to parents, I tell them that it's like having a 10-week interview because that's what it is. The child actually goes and takes two courses at Cal State with the other kids that are, would be in his class with actual courses, actual professors, and the older students in the program act as mentors. And that's a, a system that's set up to continue past that provisional summer that the other kids will mentor the younger ones. So it's a very supportive environment. And um, you know, it's, it's a self-choosing program because if it's right for your child, you basically know it. You know, your child will decide. And you know, it's a, a great way to actually try it out in the summer 
And if it doesn't work out, you go back to your regular school. You've lost nothing. Mm -hmm. So you try it out, and there's no downside at all because you just decide. And we actually, um, the program gets over 30, probably about 40% of the students are on word of mouth. And some of them come from people that tried out the program and didn't come into the program. But they still liked it so much from the summer, they recommend it to, to other people which is, I think, even a more strong endorsement than just the people that went there and were successful there. So I just wanted to add that it's, it's actually very fortunate because there's only, well, there's only a couple, of, a handful of these programs in the country. There are a lot of programs that will do one or two years, but very few that do at a, such a young age of 11 to 15. And so it's a real gem in L.A. And I recommend it highly for the right person, but it's not for all highly gifted children by any means. I wanted to also say something about the homeschool question. Um, I attend a, f a family camp that was started by Virginia Satir, and um, there's a whole group of families that come to this that homeschool full time and that have for 15 or 20 years. And so I've had the opportunity to see these ch children grow up in a completely homeschooled environment or a group homeschool, as you're describing, and go to college. And it is incredible how well they do. Um, we had a couple that went to Brown full scholarship. Um, Brown couldn't have been happier with them. I mean, they graduated, went on to graduate school. I, they had such a love of learning and such a uh, inner motivation to excel that it was, it's just a really beautiful situation. And. Um, and I think that for these highly gifted kids, sometimes it's really the only way that you can meet their needs, especially because of their asynchronous development. Mm. What's the name of the camp, Virginia Satir? What did you say? It's uh, Virginia Satir Family Camp. She's the one who actually coined the term <coughs> uh, family therapy. And she started it 25 years ago. And uh, my family has been attending that time. And um, there is a website, but you can only attend it if you actually know people who are going and you get invited to it because it's a, a community. Uh, I know, Gabby, you've been wanting to say something, and I, I want to say something about homeschooling, too. So is this about homeschooling? You know, it was kind of addressing his initial question about what do you, what do, you do when you're in the public school system. And I see. So you Let can me just add one thing about homeschooling. It's really too bad that Kathy Carney who uh, was on our program and was supposed to be here tonight, was too sick to join us. She happens to be the international expert, uh, we call her the maven, <laughs> of uh, homeschooling the uh, exceptionally and profoundly gifted. And she is so knowledgeable. She helps families design a program just like Carol was describing that fits the child perfectly. And she uh, knows more about curriculum than anyone I have ever met in my life. So she has come up with a list of free courses on anything any child could possibly be interested in free for homeschooling families. It's on the Hoagies website. That's H-O-A-G-I-E-S gifted, hoagiesgifted.org. Uh, and Kathy is available for homeschooling consults. Uh, I'm going to put on the recording her email address because she lives in cyberspace. And that's the only way to reach her. It's uh, K Carney, K K E A R N E Y, at midcoast.com. And she is available to help families design any kind of a program for any type of child in any passion area. And no one is more knowledgeable about homeschooling curriculum than she is. We are totally in support of homeschoolers at our center. So I just wanted to add, you know, for the public school, um, I think, you know, it is going to take a real system change using, you know, utilizing the current best practices in gifted education. But I think um, an effective way to go about that, I think, you know, 
public school educational education in general, they, you know, they really like evidence-based research. And, I, and in our particular school district, when that, I think it's a Nation Deceived report yes. came out supporting acceleration. Our school was against acceleration, our district, for a long time. And that report came out and, you know, we're fortunate to have a superintendent who is very supportive of gifted education and it came from the top down. And so our policies have changed that, yes, you can accelerate, um, but it also requires, you know, that sort of big picture from the top and then supporting the teachers. And so now we have, this, we're on our second cohort of teachers where they take teachers from every school and train them throughout the year in gifted education. We've changed where you know, we're working on our identification practices, but we're not excluding anyone who, you know, through pretesting shows, hey, they don't need to go cover this particular section. And they're also trying to um, coordinate math all at the same time so that you have the second grader who can go to fourth grade um, in ma at math time. And you have, and that helps the teachers because they do have a mixture of classrooms and in our district, it's very important. We want to maintain that diversity, but we also want to be able to support, you know, the needs of these children at different levels. What about in these uh, economic times? Are you finding, because uh, I know that in the school district my children are in, they're starting to cut back on the gifted. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of tough, especially with, I don't remember the acronym, but apparently, uh, gifted children are under the same, my wife thought they were under the same statute as people that are developmentally challenged. They used to be. But they're not anymore? No. Okay. So that's what I was just wondering. Well, there's one thing to take into consideration in difficult economic times. How the gifted program is financed is important. If you're assuming that the child is in the regular program in the classroom using regular per pupil operating revenue uh, and the gifted program is something that's added on top of it. There's a paraprofessional or a part-time teacher or someone who does a pull-out program. Those kinds of programs are always vulnerable, I think, in mm -hmm. tough times. If, however, the child is in a full-time gifted program, the regular per-pupil operating revenue is paying for that just as easily as it paid for a regular program. So it, it's, it's interesting, you know, to me that um, it, it, I don't think there's ever a situation in which we can't afford gifted. Um, well, but you know, it may call into question our, our concerns about how we do that. Now, accelerative opportunities are going to, you know, be in the regularly financed, you know, classrooms as well. So mm -hmm. it really doesn't well, cost anybody any more to let a child do that. Well, oh. I have uh, one family in Orange County that I'm coaching on dealing with the superintendent that essentially is um, threatening to pull her four children out of school and all of the other homeschool children. And they're creating a program where the school will be supervising the homeschooling, getting the money, the daily attendance money, because the children do have to still come in to school f to get their work and to be involved in the school. But they're essentially homeschooled. And so it's to the advantage of the school to provide all the materials and to be able to earn the, mo the per pupil money. But, and for the mother, of course, it's a win-win because she gets to homeschool and she also gets the support. Well, one of the things that our district has done that I think that has helped with that funding issue is they've centralized then the, at, at the district level where the money goes, not that things are going to the district, but that initial or before they used to have every school would have their their monies right their funds um, but they weren't really accomplishing a whole lot when it was split up like that so now they centralize that into one you know pot and they say okay we have these teachers that we train every year to try to get two from each school we spend the money on training and materials and then we work on things like when are certain classes scheduled and then we try you know get those teachers to collaborate share their materials if they can until we can you know it's going to it's going to take time but it's kind it's going you know and so then the next year we get a new cohort and eventually you know the goal is to have at least one teacher per grade level per school um, gate trained 
and then you know have the materials at each grade level so and it kind of but you it it helps so much when you have commitment from the top you know <laughs> and again i think helping to get that commitment would be evidence-based research and bringing in you know current best practices and things like a nation deceived and those kind of powerful reports so. i've had an aha tonight during this parent forum i was thinking about what Bobby was just saying, and someone else had talked about pull-out programs earlier. It may have been you or someone else. And I went back in my mind to Dawn Flanagan's uh, PowerPoint about the least effective ELL program um, was the pull-out, the short-term pull-out program you saw some immediate gains and then plummeting with no long-term positive impact whatsoever. And I thought if we had a research study of the impact of pull-out programs on gifted children's lives, I think we would see almost the same results. Maybe not as big a crash in achievement, but certainly no positive impact whatsoever. The only positive impact I've been able to see from these pull-out programs is that the kids develop friendships. And so there's some social interaction benefit, but it's unrelated to the curriculum. It's the first thing to go in a budget cut. It's extra money. Where you think about some of the other things that Bobby was mentioning earlier, how economically efficient they are, they, they do not create additional FTE. You are totally looking at grouping children differently, allowing acceleration, uh, no new teachers, no new money comes in. And the key to working with gifted children is flexibility. Flexibility. If you're willing to allow them to learn at their own rate, it does not have to cost a school district an extra dime. It only costs some thinking outside the box. There's, I was going to say, the one exception to that is when the pullout program provides a mentorship for the children and that it becomes something where they have an adult in their life who acknowledges them, who sees them, and who encourages them. Um, the reason I know this is because for one year, I taught a uh, no, sixth grade, it actually was K to sixth grade elementary school program that was a pullout program. It was a district of farm workers. And most of the children, English was their second language, but they had identified a group of about 20. And so I brought all the age, age levels together. And for one semester while I was in college, once a week, I worked with these kids. They kept in touch with me, and they all went to college. They were the first kids of anyone in their family who made it to college. And as far as I can tell, I mean, I didn't do anything that was that unusual with them, except I did some cultural awareness so that they could feel good about being, they were Hispanic and they did not feel good about themselves. That was, and then I did normal enrichment kinds of activities based on what they were interested in doing. Um, but that had a huge impact on these kids. And so I think that there is some, it depends on the teacher, it depends on the program, it depends. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I want to say I've heard of some, some good pullouts as well. Um, you know, if you get your budding writers together and you do a really nice writing program for them or your, your science kids and you bring somebody in and do really interesting experiments with them, there can be wonderful programs. But it, it reminded me of um, uh, a gate teacher, in fact, from California who called a number of years ago and she said, you know, I'm in charge of this. I think it was elementary and middle school um, group and I'm wondering how I could do my job better and I said well what are you doing and she said well you know they're they're pulled out for thinking skills 
and something else. And I always wonder about thinking skills because I think, gee, these are the best thinkers. Why would we want to teach them <laughs> thinking skills? Um, but it, it was this kind of stuff, you know. And, and, and so my answer to the question was, well, you know, what contact do you have with the classroom teacher? Because most of these kids are really frustrated. They can't go faster in math or they're really advanced readers and they're reading at too low a level or something like that. And she said, oh, we're not allowed to, you know, contact the classroom teachers. We can't interfere with that. And I'm, I'm thinking that's exactly what you want to do, is you want to interfere with what goes on in the classroom. <laughs> What do you do with the uh, gifted who is also autistic? As learning or oh, Asperger, highly Asperger and, uh, and gifted at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I work with this a lot. Um, one of the things, uh, I mean, there's, there's kind of a lot of sides to this. You know, there's the parent's perception of the child and how they deal with them and whether the child has some of the emotional acting out behaviors that often goes with Asperger's or with autistic and, and the, the at-home relationship and how that system functions. Assuming that is functioning well, <laughs> um, you then have the child going out into the world and their desire to have friendships and to relate to other people. And some of it is very skill oriented, helping them have behavioral options that they can draw on that they don't innately learn just by watching. I mean, probably the biggest deficit is that they don't, all of the unwritten rules of behavior in the world, they're oblivious to. And so the parents have, you know, what I coach parents to do is to make everything uh, explicit. And that includes the parent not being a perfectionist themselves and explici explicitly saying, oh, I messed up, gee, that's too bad, oh well. Mm -hmm. um, modeling behaviors so that the child has a mental image of how you behave in situations. If there is extreme social skills problems, UCLA has an amazing program for children that specifically breaks down every social nuance that you would need. Um, and the example that, that I use is how do you enter a group of people that are talking when you don't know those people and you would like to be a part of it? Well, it's a 14-step process. You turn to the you know, 12, 12 degrees this way. You look at the people, you glance down. I mean, this program quantifies all of the things that we do without thinking about them. And so when you have a child like that, it's called the Friends Program, and they're on the internet. Um, you want to give them as much consciousness of how to behave in situations that they don't have an innate understanding for, and they don't notice what they need to notice. And so you want to teach them how to notice it. Um, the other thing is about their internal process. If you've uh, read the book, Freaks, Geeks, and Asperger Syndrome, it's written by a 13-year-old boy who has Asperger's. And um, he discusses everything you need to know. And one of the things he very strongly advocates, and I've seen it absolutely pay dividends, is that you tell the child they have it. <laughs> so that they know that they have something that, that, that other people don't have, that it's not a death sentence, but that it is something that they're going to have to learn some new skills, that it's a challenge. And uh, that book is probably one of the most practical and wonderful books. It's designed for teenagers, you know, everything you need to know, dating, you know, how you feel about yourself, um, and the difference between Asperger's and autism. Um, and so I think that, you know, the process of helping those children uh, is one of education, emotional support, understanding, and helping them understand. And, um, you know, it's like any other, you know, deficit that you have to provide some options for them that they'll feel comfortable with based on what they need. The first program is that for teenagers? There's a child, there's one for children, and there's one for teenagers. And depending on the severity of the Asperger's, for instance, I had one client um, 
the little girl is ex highly, highly gifted. Not everyone in the program is gifted, but she's highly, highly gifted. But her emotional age was quite young. And so she was not put in the program with her chronological age, which was uh, uh, the 11 year old, the older group. She was put with the younger group. And what that how that functioned was she actually realized what the, she could see the behaviors in these younger kids that separated her from the older kids and so it provided a really positive experience for her um, and she learned the skills they were easy for her and they actually they give you homework assignments and the parents are in another class learning the same skills and how to coach their children in practicing them. And they go home and they have homework assignments. You have to make a phone call to someone and here's the steps and the parent is not, uh, you know, I call it jailing, not a jailer, but is a person who can facilitate them if they need it. But the child takes responsibility and it's a very positive mm -hmm. program. Um, but there are a lot of programs like that. And I think that, you know, the first step is to really help the child understand what they don't know and that what other people do. Because it's just like, I mean, I don't know if whoever wears glasses, remember when you got your first pair of glasses and you could suddenly see the leaves on the trees? Well, that's what it's like for these kids. They don't know that other people, when they see someone, you know, if they have face blindness, that when they see someone, they, they recognize that person the next time. They only know that when they go out into the world, it's all strangers. And they think that's normal. So as soon as you say, no, this is not what everyone experiences, and here's how we're going to deal with this, then they're empowered. Thank you. I would just like to mention a resource. Uh, this is a wonderful book by Deidre Levecki, and it's uh, called Different Minds. And it's about gifted children with uh, attention deficit disorder, with Asperger's syndrome, and with other learning deficits. It is available on the Gifted Development Center website. It's just what many parents have told us is the Bible for a gifted child with Asperger's syndrome. Thank you. And since you're mentioning books, I so often recommend Brock and Frenette ID's book, The Mislabeled Child. It's a, a quick, uh, intelligent read with a chapter on each of a number of uh, learning issues, including bless them, one on giftedness and how that can be a problem in school. But it's a, a great book for having a chapter on ADHD and one on auditory processing and visual processing and on and on. And so sometimes, you know, when we have people call us with... Um, kind of, yes, sensory processing, uh, you know, complex issues will say, you know, read about these things and you're the expert. You'll know what fits and then have an evaluation. But it's a, a good quick read. And that's a wonderful center. The IDs have a neurological assessment center in Seattle. E-I-D-E. Uh, it, 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 it's the mislabeled child is the name of their book, and I think it's ID Neurological. I think so. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful evaluation center. They're neurologists. They're neurologists. Yeah, and, and we've gotten some excellent reports from them on kids who had sensory processing disorder. They really understand that. And apparently they're doing um, work now advocating for gifted dyslexics. Yes, they're writing a new book. Have you found that uh, with your um, OEs that um, have you done any kind of... Uh, um, have you done any kind of correlation, or is there any kind of correlation between um, suicide or maybe even uh, depression and also um, maybe the use of high amounts of sugar? Because the reason why I ask that is because in some of the books that I've read, one of them in particular, um, it says The Creative Brain, A Science of Genius. It talks about how the brain uses a whole lot of sugar comparatively to the rest of the body. And I was wondering if you find that a lot of gifted kids have a tendency to eat or drink or use a lot of sugar. Uh, the glucose absorption in the brain and 
sugar consumption are two totally different things. Okay. And uh, we had a researcher uh, from Spain come out uh, and visit us in 1987, and he was doing some studies of the greater glucose absorption of gifted infants, mm -hmm. the, the brain's greater glucose absorption. But this doesn't have anything to do with glucose consumption. Okay. So it isn't like the more sugar you take in, the more your brain produces endorphins or something that helps you think. I think they're really um, two different concepts that get confused. Uh, we're not seeing sugar to um, uh, particularly enhance uh, functioning. We're not, we're actually seeing a more uh, profoundly and exceptionally gifted children who have sensitivity to milk products, mm -hmm. to uh, lactose and the casein in milk, and have even very strong behavioral outbursts and emotional ability and irritability and difficulty sleeping and uh, enuresis, bedwetting, we, all of these behavior problems that seem to be related to milk consumption that is greater than the issues that we're seeing for sugar consumption. Sugar is not the, the lead factor that we've come across in behavioral issues. But I'd like, you kind of had two different questions, so I'd like to separate them out. Um, in the original Dabrowski literature written by him, he did talk about uh, the relationship between overexcitabilities and uh, suicidal ideation, uh, a tremendous amount of inner conflict, uh, a greater increase in depression. He felt that the, um, the more evolved a person was uh, evolutionarily and uh, neurologically, the more overexcitabilities the person had, the more at risk the person was for depression, the more at risk the person was for suicidal ideation. And um, he did make that link in his early writings. Uh, those of us who've been using his work in gifted education, as, as I said earlier, uh, we've sort of sanitized and taken a lot of that out, but it, it was in the original writings. Just from the diet side of the question, we've also, oh, I'm also seeing that uh, gluten intolerance is another one that yes. is quite heightened. And I guess at a more base level, it's uh, lack of gut, gut health is something that we're seeing more and more identified within our autism spectrum disorder children, within our highly gifted who aren't functioning well, who perhaps have characteristics that look like ADHD. In some cases, they will also have ADHD, but so much of it as well as identifying that level of neurological condition, it's going back even further to the metabolic and the dietary level. Okay. One more question. What, when it also comes to um, overexcitability, do you also have you found that some of the children that have overexcitability also don't tend to eat? <laughs> because uh, I have a child that just doesn't want to eat. There's, you know, it's, it's, it's like force feeding food down him. And then every once in a while, whenever he feels like it, he'll just eat and eat and eat, and then all of a sudden it feels like he's got a growth spurt. But other than that, he won't eat. Definitely I find that eating isn't a priority for some of these kids, that there are other things in life that are much more interesting and exciting. And one of the things that I would always recommend is the concept of healthy grazing rather than trying yes. to have this formal eat three times a day because somewhere someone said that was what people should do. Um, and many of the dietitians I know would suggest that small healthy grazing when you're hungry is a better way to go and it's just creating it so that it's the possibility. I've had 
plenty of examples where children avoid things that their body has an intolerance to, but nobody realises that perhaps tomatoes and oranges, which you would think are healthy products, are a problem, but maybe five or ten years down the track they find a salicylate intolerance. Children who've avoided milk, yes. but no one's ever identified it, until somewhere down the track they realise there's a lactose intolerance. And so sometimes the body knows what works for it and it tries to avoid it, but because it's the sort of thing that good parents give their kids, is a mi mix match there. Sometimes they crave the thing that's a problem. And we spoke a little bit about sugar, and one of the things that just lately I've started seeing coming up is uh, sugar sensitivity. And it often links not with the hyper type behavior, but rather with a lethargy, and just a general lack of a feeling of well-being. It's, it's been actually a lot of adults who've identified it. But if that's an area that you're interested in, just even Googling sugar sensitivity and having a look at some of the work that they talk about there is a starting point. But finding a really good nutritionist and doing live blood tests and really looking at what's going on at that level before we worry about further up the, the triangle is useful. I, I had a daughter who, as a toddler, wouldn't eat. And the doctor recommended exactly what Helen t said to uh, give her finger foods that she, like uh, little uh, cocktail wieners that she could walk around with. And I wonder if she just didn't want to sit still long enough to eat. So this kind of grazing of uh, on protein Protein seems to be uh, particularly good, uh, well, I guess not for everybody, but uh, what we've heard from John Rady is that if a child has some hyperactive symptoms, uh, that protein every two hours seems to be very good for stabilizing glucose absorption. The problem with glucose absorption with hyperactive children is that it spikes and crashes and spikes and crashes and spikes and that is going to lead that kid to be all over the map and not be able to sit still not be able to go to sleep on schedule not be able to concentrate and so the what you're trying to do is get that nutritional system evened out so that the glucose absorption is on an even keel instead of up and down. I, I just wanted to give you a resource. There's a dietitian named Judy Converse, I believe. She's um, just put out a book, I think it's this year, and it's Diets for Special Needs Kids, and she talks about the, the GFCF, gluten-free, casein-free, among other kinds of diets um, for ADHD, autism, and Asperger's, and that kind of thing. One other resource that's useful, uh, an Australian um, researcher, and it's fed up with food additives, fed up with ADD, fed up with and um, asthma, and it's linking all the additives. And there's a huge amount of information about how all they, all of those affect. And she's got quite an extensive web page and some books that are really accessible, but goes into and she's linked where. Asthma can be aggravated by the food additives uh, and some of the stuff that they put in the asthma preventative medication actually triggers it um, and links with ADD and links with general food additives. I, I think it's referred to as the 4A allergy, asthma, ADHD and autism, the four with the toxicities and yeah. I think, I think there's some truth to all this. Sue Dengate is that person. Are there any other questions? Because we've got cookies and we can all get a sugar bust. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do about the problem of the kids going to sleep? A lot of the kids are going to sleep very late. And they're coming to school very late. Yes. And, uh, and they are just watching TV or playing games. Uh, any comments about what is it that the parents have to do when the kids don't want to go to sleep? 
<laughs> and there's 13 of us. Two, two, two. <laughs> Turn off the electrical yeah. stimulus. Uh, it tr triggers, someone here probably will tell, tell us which brain waves because I can't, but it triggers the wrong sets of brain waves. And so it's actually triggering that they, they turn it on. Work out a limit that their family believes is sufficient electronic access in a week mm -hmm. and help teach the children to make decisions about how they use that uh, budget of electronic access and which times it is. Go back to being coming the parents and being in charge of their houses. <laughs> um, but as teachers, that's, that's a little bit tricky. Um, teach medica meditation. Teach the kids ways that they can turn off that complex brain. Talk to them about the fact that you get that they can't turn off that complex brain. And so investigate both strategies for relaxation and meditation because they may be in a household where they're not going to be supported with this. So if you teach them the vet benefit of it, teach ways of putting away your ideas so they're still there. I mean, one of the ones that has worked really nicely with the kids that I've worked with is the concept of um, a chest of drawers and talk about the fact that if you put away one of your favourite toys into one of those drawers in the chest of drawers and then you shut the drawer, is the toy still there? And if you want to play with it in the morning, you'll be able to open the drawer and get it out. Well, I know that you've got lots and lots of amazing ideas that are racing around in your brain that are just as important as that toy. If you put those ideas away in a special drawer and you shut the drawer, will the idea still exist? Yes, it will. But once you've popped it away, it's not going to go away. So you can just leave it there safely. You can give your brain a chance to have a rest. And then when you wake up in the morning, you'll be able to open it up and you'll be able to get that idea or that worry, because sometimes it's a worry, you'll be able to get it out. And because you've given your brain a rest, mm -hmm. will it be able to do a better job in thinking about it? Most of the ideas will never come out of that chest of drawers, mm -hmm. but it's validating where they're at. It's giving them a possible strategy. And I often find the kids say, oh, no, no, not a chest of drawers. I've got this fantastic. And they describe <laughs> what it is that they're going to do, how they're going to store it. So that can be useful. So I think that especially if you're not in the family where the problem's happening, mm -hmm. to give them an idea that it's normal, that you've got a brain that just can't switch off because you've got so many great ideas. So these are some of the things you can think about. And I think that's quite empowering. I think I'll try that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I've had a number of, of parents who came in and said, I can't get my child to go to sleep. I, I've tried everything. And um, there's actually a woman in Seattle. Uh, she has a website, positivecentral.com. And she does hypnotherapy tapes for children to help them be creative, but also to learn how to relax and how to turn off their brain, which is very active. She has two gifted children herself. And she will actually make tapes that are for specific children. Uh, I've, I've been referring ones that had specific fears and, and phobias. But um, she does have generic ones, including one that will teach them their timetables while they sleep. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that Di Lavecchi uh, did find this problem in uh, the majority of the children that she was uh, counseling. Uh, she's a therapist. She works with a lot of gifted children with ADHD and with Asperger's syndrome. And she works with profoundly and exceptionally gifted children. And she said that she's noted that the higher the child's IQ, the uh, more delicate the balance is between stimulation and relaxation that they need to get to sleep. That, it, that it's a very fine line that the child has to figure out how to walk because if they're overstimulated, they can't sleep, and if they're understimulated, they can't sleep. And so I think it really helps to let the kids know that um, getting to sleep is 
something real. It's not like it's 8 o'clock, you ought to be tired. If you were a good child, you'd be asleep now because I'm tired of you. And if you can just acknowledge that even adults take sleeping pills sometimes because they too have trouble turning their brains off. And let's see what strategies we can come up with. It could be calming music. It could be a back rub. It could be telling a story. Anna Marie, all, every night for her whole life, from the time she could read, has read herself to sleep. And uh, so we have different strategies for finding just that right balance to be able to nod off. And if you figure it out, please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing too is I think that trying to help them realize that resting, even if you're not going straight to sleep, is okay. Or if they wake up, not to, to try to not get stressed about the fact that they're not sleeping. Because maybe tonight you don't need quite as much sleep as you might need tomorrow night or you might have needed yesterday because you might have done more things today or less things. I think that there's this idea in helping parents realize that if their child is not going to sleep, not to make a big deal of it, because that actually builds up the stress level. And when we're stressed, we can't do other things. We can't make good decisions. Yeah. I actually um, have some experience of that. I had a, a child who's profoundly gifted, and she um, periodically would have periods uh, like every two or three months where she would go through really chronic insomnia and she just would not be able to sleep and I just told her that you know when that was happening she just would email me at two o'clock in the morning and then I would come into school the next day and check my email at 7 15 and I would see there was an email from her at 2 a.m. and I would know that she was not going to come into school and that, that if that was happening that she had the freedom and the flexibility to take the time to reset her clock and then she would come back into school and then she would be okay again but um, she really struggled with exactly what you just described about that sensitivity between too much stimulation or not enough stimulation and she's now about 17 and she's just starting to be able to really self-regulate much more successfully but I mean this is a child I've known since I was two so you know I've really seen the, the patterning and she's gone through those enormous hormonal spikes you know in puberty which really causes so many problems uh, with her sleeping prob sleeping gra trying to get the sleeping thing right so um, you know, speaking of overexcitabilities, Stephanie Tolan has written articles about this particular phenomenon, and she talks about the, the psych in psychomotor overexcitability. And she says, you come to a conference like this, and you get all these ideas, and you're lying awake at night because you're so overstimulated. Well, you're not hyperactive and moving around, but you can't get your brain to turn off. And she says, you know, have you had a conversation with a friend that you haven't talked with for a long time, and it's at 11 o'clock at night, and your head's just buzzing, and you just can't stop thinking about all of these ideas? And she calls that a kind of psychomotor overexcitability that we are uh, overlooking. And she had uh, some very interesting uh, observations in her article. She first said that she noticed in her son RJ that if he had been in a school environment that was understimulating, it was like his brain hadn't done enough mental work for him to be able to go to sleep at night, and she could tell how good the school was by whether he could fall asleep or not. And then the other thing she said is that um, that 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 the gifted have, particularly the exceptionally gifted, have erratic sleep patterns. And it's like the food thing that you were describing with your child. She says they do that with sleep. Uh, RJ is a very creative uh, director of plays in New York now, and he's, uh, he'll go days without sleeping 
because he's working on a creative project and then he'll crash and sleep for, I don't know, 30 hours. But he did that when he was a teenager too. He did that same pattern. So we're seeing uh, a lot of night owl gifted kids, especially visual spatial kids. They have a different biological clock. We have homeschooling families that homeschool at one o'clock in the morning because that's when that particular family is most alert. And it may be different from the rest of the population, but in, in cyberspace, you can kind of get away with having a different clock. So I think we have to get out of the concept of what's normal and kind of normalize aberrant sleeping patterns. Um, also, we have to remember that at a certain point, um, these people are not going to be children anymore, and they'll have some control over their lifestyle, and they'll be able to choose jobs that fit whatever their sleeping pattern is or whatever their eating pattern is. Um, I have a friend who's a brilliant computer scientist, and he will stay up for two or three days solving a problem, and he will solve that problem by playing video games. You know, I mean, but the whole time he has to have the faith that the answer will come to him and and then pop it comes to him he solves the problem and he's got a new robotic algorithm or whatever it is and then he sleeps for two days um, and so he has come to learn that that's how he has to work in order to be brilliant and so as children you know we we you know as parents we have this idea well it's our responsibility to make sure they blah 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 um, but they're going to be adults someday and you can say to them you know eventually you know if you don't want if you aren't good at writing or you don't want to um, have to write things out get an administrative assistant you know if you're if you can't get your taxes paid you hire an accountant you know there are things that you can adapt for eventually and so as children sort of noticing it and honoring it and saying you know, well, this is how I can help you through this. And, you know, your college applications have to be in on time. You write the essay, I'll do the rest. You know, and so you can, you know, some people would say it's enabling, but I consider it, you know, playing to their best traits and their best skills. And then there are people like Richard. Richard doesn't need sleep. And we, there has been a study that shows that the higher the IQ, the less sleep many very profoundly gifted children need. And I always tell parents, you have to hire somebody to sleep for you. I had <laughs> one parent, this is actually a, a family that Kathy Carney worked with, who had, a, a, they adopted a child who never slept. A absolutely, unbelievably brilliant child. And uh, the mother said, I just thought that he was so smart because he had been awake twice as long <laughs> as everybody else. <laughs> so with this, we're going to have our carbo sugar high and have our cookies. And thank you for being here. <laughs>